Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He's done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm has gotten Him the victory. The Lord has made known His victory. He has revealed His vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break in a joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods Clap their hands, let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. And in our gospel, um, and the light shines in the darkness, and the, and the darkness, darkness is not over them. The Gospel is from Luke chapter 1, Mary's Magnificat, and would you please rise as that's read. <clears throat> and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's looked with favor upon the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their throne and lifted up the lowly and filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months with Elizabeth, and then returned to her home. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And please be seated. <clears throat> well, dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the one of the pursuits that many of us have is to be happy. To be happy, I mean, it's right there. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is right there in the Declaration of Independence. It's what we call an inalienable right, which was given to every human being by their creator. In talking with people over my years, um, I can't tell you how many people have said the phrase, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, happy days keep us from having unhappy days, and most of us would like to avoid unhappy days. I mean, after all, it's, a, it's an unhappy day when you get up in the morning and put on your pants backwards and they fit better. <laughs> you know, it's an unhappy day when you get to the office and the 60 Minutes news crew is waiting for you there. It's an unhappy day when you go to the doctor and he says, you're doing pretty good for a person twice your age. You know, it's an unhappy day when you're driving home from work in the summer and your horn gets stuck on behind a motorcycle gang on the freeway. <laughs> you know, it's tough to have unhappy days like that. And when you do, it's easy to think, all I want to do is be happy. I just want to be, I just want to be happy and the troubles of the world will fade away into oblivion. But the thing is, happiness depends on happenings. Happiness depends on something external. Happiness is derived from the word hap, which means luck or happenstance, good fortune or positive circumstances. Happiness comes from something external, but joy, on the other hand, is different. Joy is what comes from the internal, from your heart. Happiness is based on chance. Joy is based on choice. Now, 
Tonight, for our third Wednesday Advent service, we're looking at the wonderful hymn, Joy to the World. Besides Silent Night, it's probably the most sung Christmas hymn of all time. It's a wonderful song. We sing Silent Night when we light our candles. We sing Joy to the World right before we leave this place of worship. The words to <clears throat> Joy to the World, it's always interesting. Joy always wants you to look when we have hymns on who wrote the text and who wrote the tune. And Isaac Watts, you can see, wrote the tune. As a young boy, Isaac Watts, when he was in middle school, complained to his father that the hymns that they sang at church were horribly boring. That's what middle school kids have done through the ages. The, the boring, musty, crusty tunes and meaningless words and his father said, like all fathers would say to their teenage sons when they complain about the songs we sing at church, he said, well, if you think you can write a better hymn, you'd write one yourself. So Isaac Watts went home and went to his room and wrote his first hymn, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. The year was 1690. 1690 when he wrote When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. Joy to the world is a word, was Watts' attempt to put scripture to music. The hymn is based on Psalm 98, which I just read, especially the words, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, break into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord, he also based it on Mary's Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my maker. Remember that um, Mary had just been told by the angel that she would bring the Messiah into the world. And that theme of joy and praise from Mary and from Psalm 98 inspired Isaac Watts to write the words of this majestic hymn. The words were put to melody by George Frederick Handel, who of course also wrote the Alleluia Chorus. And the tune and the words for centuries have brought hearts to soaring heights. The first verse of the hymn teaches us that there is joy in the world when the king is received. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth Receive her king, let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. There is joy in the world when the king is received, though at the time of Jesus, when he was born, not all people were joyful, nor did all people receive him. King Herod, for instance, as we know, was not happy at all when he found out that this king was born, he was terribly threatened. He sent the wise men to find out where this king was born that was bringing this new world order. Herod was paranoid, full of anxiety, and there's no way that he was going to tolerate a rival king, even if he's an infant. So he sent those wise men to find out when, where Jesus was born. The wise men, of course, went, brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they, the wise men, show us what it means to receive a king, that there's joy in their hearts as there is joy in our hearts. When we receive Christ as Lord of our life, it's like a body craving food and water. Your spirit thirsts for that relationship, joyful inside relationship with God that is fulfilled. And when we receive the King, our hearts are filled with joy and hope. There's a Christmas card I saw a number of years back that said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need was pleasure, God would have sent an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. Forgiveness, and that's why God sent us a Savior. There is joy in the world when the King is received. Second verse tells us that there is joy in the world when the Savior reigns. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. 
Let all who let all their songs employ while field and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding poem, joy, repeat the sounding joy. Now, just as there is a difference between being happy and being joyful, there's also a difference between receiving Christ and letting him reign in our lives. Jesus, through his ministry, encountered a lot of people who wanted to receive him, but he, they didn't want him to reign over them. They wanted Jesus as Savior, but didn't want Jesus as Lord. In the same way, today there's a lot of people who you know, would like Jesus as Savior. Yes, I want to be saved. Yes, I want to go to heaven. But Jesus is Lord of your life, ruling, reigning over your life. Some people are challenged by this. They don't want Jesus to be Lord in their lives. They want to do what they want to do in treating other people at work, at their New Year's parties, the way they use language under pressure, whatever they post on their Facebook page. They, they want Jesus to be Savior, but not Lord of their lives. It's very important to receive Christ as the first step of faith, but then we have to let him rule, reign in our lives as Lord. Because if you don't receive him and let him reign and rule in your life, then you miss out on joy. Indecisiveness and hypocrisy can just zap the joy out of life, like those bug zappers we have in Minnesota. You know, your bug gets a little too close and it zzz, and they, they're zapped. That's what happened when we live with hypocrisy and indecisiveness, when Jesus isn't Lord of our lives. It zaps the joy out of our life because we're not really sure where our core person is, where our core values is. And so we think or behave, we're thrown from one direction to the other without Jesus being Lord of our lives. But when he's Lord of our life, joy to the world, the Savior reigns. When he reigns and is Lord of your life, then you have joy that can repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. The third verse teaches us that there's joy in the world when the sinner repents. This is kind of the funny thing, that you know that sin promises happiness. Do this, just give in, just ignore what your mother taught you, just ignore what your wife wants you to do. Not a big deal, just give in and move on. Sin promises happiness, but instead sin delivers sorrow. Joy to the world, uh, no more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Sin brings a bitter curse, but there's joy in heaven when the sinner repents. When you turn your life to God, let him be Lord of your life and repent and get closer to God. That's when you experience that real inner kind of joy. Have you, have we really repented of those things of which we need to repent? If you don't feel joy in your heart, you know, maybe there's something for which you need to repent. Turn over to God. Let him rule in your hearts. Think about that this this night, this week, this Christmas, this season. Because the last verse teaches us that there is joy when truth rules with grace. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Jesus rules the world with truth and grace. You know, they both need to go together and they do with God. Sometimes the truth isn't very gracious. Sometimes when I hear someone say, well, I just tell it like it is, I often think, well, they just want to say something that will offend because they want to go heavy on the truth, but light on the grace. I like what someone once said, truth without love is dogmatism. Love without truth is sentimentality, but truth with love is true Christianity. Jesus brings joy because he's the perfect balance of truth and grace. He rules the world with truth and grace. He is the truth, the life, and the way. So think of it this way. True joy will be yours this Christmas if you receive Christ, repent of your sins, and let Jesus reign in your heart and life with truth 
and grace. You know, when we, when we move beyond the tinsel and lights and cookies and presents, we see the real gift of Christmas, that's joy, true joy, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let's close with a prayer.